So it's my pleasure to give the second talk, um, and I thought I'd choose something uh, slightly less common, and that's recurrent idiopathic priapism. Not pure ischemic, not pure non-ischemic, uh, less common, but still a, um, a concerning condition uh, that sometimes causes uh, some consternation for uh, practitioners. These are my disclosures, which you've already seen. Recurrent idiopathic priapism uh, is uh, repeated priapism events, which is venoclusive or ischemic in nature, without an overt cause, no obvious medication, no hematologic condition underlying the problem. The term stuttering priapism, which I've never loved, refers to uh, repeated priapism events uh, that are ischemic, and the vast majority of these are related to hematologic conditions, especially uh, sickle cell disease. The management of uh, RIP, recurrent idiopathic priapism, should follow all of the tenets of ischemic priapism management. Uh, but the focus, in addition, should be on providing the patient with tools to avoid lengthy priapism events and avoiding the emergency room visit if possible. Um, ischemic priapism in a patient diagnosed with ischemic priapism, now this is not recurrent idiopathic priapism, uh, Concerto therapies, observation, oral medications such as terbutaline or Sudafed, cold compresses and exercise are not likely to be successful and should not delay definitive therapy. So what the AUA means by this statement is that the patient should still start along the pharmacologic management of ischemic priapism by the fourth hour, but in the interim, if you get called from home, somebody's used an intracavernosal injection and they're at two hours, it's not unreasonable to spend a short period of time uh, using uh, conservative strategies such as Sudafed or ice packs or an ice bath or running up and down stairs, for example, as some of our patients sometimes do. Clinicians should begin treatment for persistently rigid, pharmacologically induced erections no later than four hours after onset. So if you have somebody who's using intracavernosal injections, which for I think most urologists is the most common cause of priapism in their practice, and we want to make sure that we are starting pharmacological reversal at no later than four hours. And the reason for that, this is that there's um, uh, evidence that microscopic uh, muscle degeneration uh, can start at, at that time point. Uh, clinicians should counsel all patients with persistent ischemic priapism that there is a risk of erectile dysfunction. This is a really useful um, uh, thing to say to your residents, your junior resident, July, first visit to the emergency room to see somebody with priapism. This is something that should be said uh, to patients to forestall any uh, concerns or complaints from patients uh, after uh, management. Clinicians should counsel patients with a priapism event of longer than 36 hours that erectile function recovery is very, very low. Indeed, at this juncture, uh, the discussion is whether you should treat them at all or whether you should just uh, do pain management. It's worth noting and it's worth asking patients uh, whether this 36 hours was continuous. Uh, sometimes it has not been continuous, so delving into that question would be important. Clinicians should manage acute ischemic priapism with intracavernosal phenylephrine and corporal aspiration with or without irrigation as first-line therapy and prior to any uh, shunting. And this is very important uh, for the practicing urologist in clinic. Uh, clinicians should ensure that patients do not have a pharmacologically induced rigid erection before leaving the office. So if you're training somebody in intracavernosal injections, if you've done a curvature assessment or a duplex Doppler ultrasound in your practice, it behooves you medical legally to hold on to that patient in the office until that erection is gone. Now, if you say you don't want to wait four hours, then I would do what I do in my practice, which is I keep an eye on these people for an hour, and if at an hour they have penetration hardness erection, we actually give them a small dose of intracavernosal phenylephrine to get rid of the erection, and then you don't have to worry about him being at home with a four to six hour erection and not really understanding what he should do next. Uh, this is a diagrammatic representation of a cavernosal smooth muscle myocyte. Um, the belief is, and this is congratulations to Bud Burnett for shedding light on this, uh, that um, RIP may result from PD5 uh, pathway dysregulation, so the enzyme PD5, phosphodiesterase type 5, or at least this being a contributor. I don't think this explains all of the patients with 
uh, or IP. If you look in the box, you'll see that the nerve ending uh, supplies nitric oxide, non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic neurotransmitter. It activates guanylate cyclase, and this uh, breaks down GTP to uh, cyclic GMP. Uh, PDE5 is an enzyme which degrades cyclic GMP to just a form of GMP, which is non-active. Cyclic GMP is what causes sequestration of calcium within the cytoplasmic reticulum and within the uh, outside of the cell, and that's what leads to reduction in calcium levels and smooth muscle relaxation. So the belief is that there is a, a, a paucity, that there's a, a diminution in the level of PDE5 inside the cavernosal myocyte. And I think this is a reasonable explanation, and knockout mice have shown that this is a contributor. But as I said, I don't believe this is the whole story. Um, from the upcoming AUA uh, guidelines, uh, pay, clinicians should inform patients with recurrent uh, idiopathic priapism that optimal strategies to prevent subsequent episodes are unknown. So there is no definitive strategy that has been shown in a randomized control trial, which may not be ethical in priapism, in large cohort studies, observational studies, to, uh, to prove that one strategy is more effective than the other. We'll talk a little bit more about this in detail in a few minutes. However, there are two basic steps. This man walks into your office. I'm waking up with erections at night. They're lasting um, more than four hours. It's happening frequently. I don't do sickle cell disease. I'm not using cocaine. I'm not using intracavernous injections. The first step is training the patient in strategies to avoid full-blown priapism uh, and an ER visit. And then the second step is mitigation. Are there some ways that we can reduce the frequency or duration of these recurrent uh, idiopathic episodes? The emergency maneuver is very straightforward for a urologist, um, but it's impressive to me how often this is not done in a structured fashion. So essentially, we're going to train the patient how to use intracavernosal phenylephrine at home. Now, the first thing I want to point to is to go all the way down to the very bottom um, button on the slide, and that is to educate the patient regarding hypertension and reflex bradycardia. So intracavernosal phenylephrine, if absorbed systemically, kind of cause a raise, uh, rise in blood pressure, and sometimes a very dramatic rise in blood pressure. And if there's a significant rise in blood pressure, these patients can get reflex bradycardia. In fact, we've had several cases over my 26 years in practice where we thought the patient had arrested, but on a monitor, their pulse rate was 20. So how we train these patients is identical to intracavernosal uh, trimix or bimix or cabraject injection training. One ml of phenylephrine, which is usually um, uh, 10,000 micrograms in a 10 ml bottle, that's 1,000 micrograms per ml, and 9 ml of saline uh, gives a, um, a 1,000 microgram per ml solution. Label and date the bottle, um, and you can send the patient home with that bottle if you wish. Um, we suggest that they refrigerate it to reduce the risk of contamination. We tell them then for a penetration hardness erection uh, that's longer than one to two hours in duration that they administer 250 micrograms and repeat this uh, once 15 to 30 minutes later. And if it's not uh, completely gone by then, if they're not less than penetration hardness, that they should visit the clinic if it's during the day or they should go to the emergency room. The mitigation strategies um, revolve around four, uh, four things. One is the use of PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, the second is ketoconazole or prednisone, which is my favorite uh, uh, choice of treatment. Antiandrogens such as uh, casodex, bicolutamide, or LRH agonists like uh, Lupron, etc. So this is the original publication back in 2005 suggesting that dysregulation of phosphodiesterase type 5 uh, in erectile tissue is a mechanism of uh, this condition. Um, this is different than sickle cell disease for sure, um, and I think it's a contributor, um, but I'm, I don't believe it's the entire story. This is the first report. It's a very, very small case report from a Bud Burnett's group at Hopkins looking at the use of this. Now, if you read down this abstract, you will see down here that you've got three patients, and you can add this to the uh, pantheon of famous papers where there were three papers, including uh, Peyronie's first description of Peyronie's disease, including uh, Davis' intubated ureterotomy and Nesbitt's first uh, description of the Nesbitt plication. So I think this is a thought-provoking, but not a definitive report 
on the role of PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, this is an excellent article um, by Larry Levine's group in Sexual Medicine Reviews, which is worthwhile reading if you see these patients. And it goes down the various strategies that have been used, and there are many, uh, for the reduction in frequency and severity uh, of RIP events. If you look at the second row here, terbutaline, which really, in my opinion, has no role in the management of ischemic priapism in any patient, um, but there's certainly no uh, literature on its use in recurrent idiopathic priapism. Digoxin is an interesting drug. It's a, um, a cardiac glycoside, it's a sodium potassium ATPase inhibitor, and it causes sequestration of calcium within the cardiac and technically within the penile myocytes. And of course, that causes increased contraction, which is an anti erection event. Um, when I was a fellow with Erwin Goldstein, we were using this, and we had some moderate success in patients with um, recurrent ischemic priapism, although I have to tell you that it wasn't clear whether uh, most of those patients had hematologic or whether they were truly recurrent idiopathic priapism. Hydroxyurea has not been shown to benefit in priapism in general, although it's used in sickle cell patients. And remember, when sickle cell patients um, uh, get priapism, it's a sickling event that causes that. Gabapentin, again, no significant uh, literature supporting its role in recurrent idiopathic bypass. And likewise with baclofen, although I see patients using this all the time. And we have used it, but I have to tell you, uh, the um, uh, prevalence of this condition is not very high. So gathering large series is a problem. And um, the results have been kind of a mixed bag. Uh, ketoconazole and prednisone I'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes, but this is our go-to strategy. And the first person to report this was Larry Levine, and I think it's an excellent strategy, although it's not 100% effective. Uh, there is no role for finasteride in the management of priapism. If you believe uh, that uh, there is some role of uh, testosterone uh, in the management of these patients. And, and the argument in favor of that is that ketoconazole reduces uh, testosterone and, and it helps and therefore one would have to believe that by reducing testosterone, at least nocturnally, that there is a value uh, in the management of recurrent idiopathic priapism. However, finasteride and dutasteride do not lower a serum testosterone level. They only lower DHT levels and DHT is not uh, really a very potent erectogenic hormone. Antiandrogens such as flutamide, bicalutamide, etc., have been used in uh, recurrent uh, ischemic priapism. And um, there is some evidence that they work, although the literature supporting this is pretty sparse. Just make sure that you're measuring uh, LFT levels in these patients. Uh, luprolide, of course, is the definitive therapy. The problem with uh, drugs like luprolide, if you use them chronically, it's not just a state of hypogonadism, it's a state of agonadism. And we tell all of our patients who are using uh, LH or H agonists or antagonists, let's say with prostate cancer, uh, that they're at risk for non-sexual consequences such as bone, sugar, and heart problems osteoporosis, or at least bone mineral density loss, uh, hemoglobin A1C changes, and an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. Estrogen hasn't been used, I think, in urology for many, many decades. And of course, in the old prostate cancer era, it was associated with venothromboembolic events in men. And then the concept of PD-5 inhibitors. Now, this seems incredibly uh, counterintuitive. But Bud Burnett's argument, and I think not unreasonably so, is that if some man has a, a deficiency or an insufficiency of PD-5, that if you give uh, patients a regular PD-5 inhibitors, that it may in fact upregulate the enzyme PDE5, and that may go some way towards uh, improving the recurrent idiopathic priapism patient's experience. I think it's an intriguing concept. But I have to tell you that the, um, my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues who do what I do for a living has been that it's not particularly effective. And I think we're still waiting on uh, more data from the Hopkins group. Uh, this is a paper that came out from David Robb's group in London uh, just uh, last month. Um, this is looking at 114 men who were diagnosed with recurrent ischemic priapism. Now, these are not all men with recurrent idiopathic priapism. In fact, there was a mixed bag. 42 of them were initiated in PD-5 inhibitor therapy, but they had only 24 evaluable patients, not randomized controlled, only 24 patients with mixed etiologies, as you see here. Idiopathic, half of them, sickle cell disease, and drug-induced in, uh, in, in 11 and 1, respectively. The median length of PD-5 inhibitor use is about three months, so very short term. 
Uh, reduced emergency department visits per month, uh, four, fourfold, reduced priapism duration and priapism frequency. Uh, and of the 24 patients with recurrent idiopathic priapism, 22 of them reported improvement in priapism. So again, supporting Bud's suggestion that there's a strategy uh, to be followed here. I have to tell you, while I don't have 24 patients, I probably have in excess of a dozen patients. And uh, it's very uncommon that people get any um, prolonged benefit from this strategy. But I think we need uh, better, more um, structured uh, uh, controlled trials. I do want to mention to you um, what I believe is a related concept, which I'm sure you hear from time to time from some of your patients, and that's the concept of sleep-related painful erections, where men wake up in the middle of the night and they've got painful erections that they have difficulty getting rid of. Now, this is known as a parasomnia, uh, and the International Consultation on Sleep Disorders of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine defines SRPEs, penile pain that occurs during erections, typically during rapid eye movement sleep episodes. So it's a bit of an umbrella term for a group of disorders where men wake up with painful erections at night. Its etiology is unknown. It does, however, have a significant impact upon sleep pattern and uh, most of our patients, like the Lutz patient who has nocturia times seven, uh, are suffering from uh, sleep deprivation. Uh, there are some of us uh, who believe that this may in fact be at the lower end of the recurrent idiopathic priapism spectrum. So I actually manage these patients uh, like they are going to be flipped over into RIP. I do use baclofen in this group and there's anecdotal reports uh, that it's a benefit and I have to say in a small group of patients I've seen some improvement but there's no uh, structured analysis of this group. Uh, we do train them in home uh, intracavernosal neosinephrine, and we do talk to them about the, um, the uh, flow in the management of ischemic priapism being in the emergency room uh, by four hours. Uh, this is from uh, David Ralph's group, and that's from the paper I just showed you. Uh, typically, this group of patients are um, thought to be kind of middle-aged white males. Um, I have to say I've seen plenty of young men uh, with this problem. So... Um, it's still unclear exactly uh, what's going on with SRPE, but I'm sure that you have or you will see them in your practice. So the take-home messages in this discussion about recurrent idiopathic priapism is its unclear mechanism of action. You should treat an episode in these patients like any type of ischemic priapism and do not waste time. Train the patient in at-home phenylephrine injection. Educate them in particular about the risk of hypertension, reflex bradycardia, so that home intracavernosal neosinephrine injection should ideally be witnessed or should at least be administered uh, while they are bedside so they can lie down in case they become hypotensive. Um, it is my experience uh, in all of these recurrent uh, priapism patients, whether it's sickle cell or idiopathic, this is a very high rate of attrition. And this is why it's quite difficult to get long-term follow-up on these patients. And then uh, mitigation strategies, you should certainly explore those. And the one that I use is ketoconazole and prednisone. Um, we start off with 200 milligrams three times a day and add in prednisone at 500 milligrams. And we do that for two weeks. And our goal is to get the patients down to 200 milligrams nocturnally without any steroid support. We have some men who run 200 milligrams of, of uh, ketoconazole twice a day, and we do monitor testosterone levels in those patients. Um, but I think this is a very reasonable strategy, and I've seen some significant success with it.